So, uh, so I want to show you how the computation goes, and in particular, how you see in this computation. I told you cat's rice is a, 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 gives you a dictionary between these complexity problems and random matrix problem. And in fact, uh, I show you that this uh, transition for the spike tensor when p equal two. So when you're looking at spike matrices, that's uh, that's the BBP transition. It's purely spectral, since we're talking about matrices. But how when you go to tensors, and that looks something completely different from the BBP, not talking about matrices. In fact, once you do the cat's rice computation, it is exactly a BBP transition and nothing else. And, I, so, and what did we see? We saw a big, big different pictures depending on P, K, but the important thing to remember is, for getting the details, is you had three phases of complexity. One where essentially you had no hope of recovering, uh, of detecting or even re um, recovering or even detecting the signal because your Gibbs measure, your complexity was concentrated on the equator if your spike was the North Pole. The other extreme phase was a simple phase where where you had only one minimum, or the Gibbs measure was concentrated very near the, the spike. It didn't mean then that uh, recovery would be easy. In fact, it's an NP-hard problem for people <coughs> three or higher. You can't do that when the strength of the spike is, is uh, finite, because you still have the equator. So if you start from the equator, escaping it is hard. All right? So you, in order to solve this problem, either you have to start to have a warm start, start inside the good region, or you have to have a strength of the spike which diverges fast enough. There is a conjecture of, on what exactly the, the, this fast enough means. Or you need um, to repeat the experiment sufficiently many times. Right? And uh, that is, instead of me giving you one picture of this and say, find the spike, let me give you a thousand pictures of that, and then you find the spike. All these things kind of solve the problem of the initial barrier to cross. But at least at the information theory point of view, you, there, your complexity is such, your, if you want, your, uh, or your Gibbs measure is such that the, the, you can find the signal, the spike. But more importantly, there was this intermediate, f intermediate phase where uh, the you had you could find something correlated with the signal because you had this intermediate region where you had a high comp but you still had a high complexity there, plenty of local minima, right? So in this, so that was the intermediate phase. In the kind of simple phase, once you escape the initial trouble around the equator, then you go down and all your uh, minimization procedure, whatever you do to find this, will end at the same point, right? this unique point. So statistically, this is something that statisticians like, because that means that you are doing consistent estimation. You find one estimator, and this estimator, when the size of your sample grows or whatever, converges to the truth. But in particular, it's also mentally very satisfying. You do a million experiments, you will always find the same estimator. Whereas in this intermediate phase, e even if you so manage to get to this area, the level of your performance, the value of your loss function, if you want, will always be the same. This will concentrate. So you will always have the same performance. But if you do uh, ten, I mean, a thousand runs of your optimization procedure, you will end up in different places, right? Which means that your estimator will be different from one run to the next. And I can tell you, for statisticians, this is a hard thing to take, right? Because how is there truth in estimation where the estimator just does random things? Okay. So. This phase is kind of new for statistics. It has been there for a long time. I'm not saying that I'm introducing for the first time, but it's, and I believe that this phase is there in many, many different problems than the spike tensor. 
it, it asks for some kind of a mental change in the way you do statistics. And this is what is happening, in, for instance, I believe in machine learning and in other places. So, uh, so I will first finish this computation quickly so that this whole thing, in fact, this intermediate phase is simply BBP. And then I will maybe just chat a bit about other things, uh, other model than the spike tensor in which we could do something. So the spike tensor is a nice model because first it's useful, but uh, because we can compute. I can show you the exact computation of complexity. You can comp look at the Gibbs measure. But it's not such a nice problem because, in fact, you have this uh, hard phase around the equator, which, which is painful. Right? So in some sense, it's a, it's a good and a bad model. All right? But <coughs> what I am advocating for is in any model where you have a loss function, a likelihood uh, that you want to minimize or likelihood that you want to maximize, Depending on your signal-to-noise ratio, the size of your sampling set or whatever, you, always, you should always have this intermediate phase, right, which is, which is there, there. There's the simple phase, which goes back to statistics of the beginning of the 20th century, essentially, which means when you have a large enough sample, a large enough signal-to-noise ratio, things are cool. There was a lot of progress in this direction, and that's not 20th century math. That's very recent. I'm thinking essentially of, of, of the work of... Uh, Andrea Montanari and his collaborators, showing that in many of those models, when the, sam the sampling size was large enough, in fact, you were in this simple situation. Uh, but, of course, the other extre extreme, the place where you cannot estimate anything, not very useful. But the fact that there is this intermediate phase where you can estimate things, let's say, have positive correlation with the truth, uh, with at a lo much lower signal-to-noise ratio, uh, that's useful. Okay. So uh, I will illustrate that, and then maybe I'll say a few things about recent progress on dynamics of these things, which might be interesting for the future of this. Because of course, what I'm describing up to now is the statics of this thing, description of the landscape, but how you navigate it is another story. Okay. So, so let me come back to this uh, spike tensor model very quickly. So the spike tensor model boils down to the BBP after the Katz-Rice formula. So once you apply that first formula, this P tensor model becomes a BBP transition problem. <laughs> All right, so once more, the katz rice formula, which again is a simple formula. So in the end, so you, I will compute in this case something a little more uh, precise than what I did before. I will compute the number of critical points. Uh, so what, what I described with a... I will remind you what that means. Critical points, let's say, of index L. Uh, so how did I call that? Uh, U and Z. Remember what that means. That means the critical points below level U or NU when it's normalized properly and such that the, the overlap with the, the spike, right, so if the spike is here, that's the equator... This is the coordinate I will call, let's say, x1. And in this direction, you have x2, x3, etc. And here, this is when I will look at the z above a certain level here. So this level, so I will look at this cap. I could look at that, of course. Okay? And this height, so this will be 1 minus r. This height here. Okay, so that I can use, I can play with the two parameters, the, the height of the function, the value of the function, and the value of this parallel, because we want to distinguish in this thing. Okay. Of course, in this direction, the model is completely rotationally invariant, so very little problem. So this, of course, remember, it's the integral on the cap. So it's the integral on this set. 
of the usual thing, expectation of absolute value of determinant of the Hessian uh, <coughs> indicator, okay, I continue my formula here, indicator that my function f is smaller than whatever I knew at x, uh, indicator that the index is l, conditioned by the fact that the function is critical. And then I must integrate against the density of the gradient of f at 0 at x dx. Okay, that's Katz-Fry's formula, as always. So the real problem is, of course, as before, is we have to compute this... Uh, I'm sorry? Yes, yes, z, uh, sure, z is, I'm sorry, z is 1 minus r. So I, now I, I must admit that I forgot if I defined this as being below 1 minus r or above, right? If I did it the other way around, forgive me, and I'm switching the definition. Of course, it's the same thing. Once you know how to compute one, you, know, you will know how to compute the other one. Okay? Good. So in the end, what you need to understand is, of course, so that, of course, you can write as this integral you can write as 2 pi n over 2 minus 1 half divided by gamma of n over 2 minus 1 half 1 over 2 pi uh, uh, when I say I, of course I, I, I write this equation I, I write this integral you know uh, you, uh, and believe me this is, this is simple and then I integrate between 1 minus r and 1 this is a one dimensional integral and then I have 1 minus x1 squared, as always when you do a spherical integration, n over 2 minus 1. And then you have this density, which will be an exponential minus n over 2p, if you compute this gradient. I forgot how I call the strength of my spike, maybe lambda. Lambda squared, k squared, x1 to the 2k two k, two k minus 2, if I'm not mistaken. And then... So all that comes from first the volume element here when you integrate, then this density. And on top of that, then you multiply all this by the important object, which is the expectation of the absolute value of the determinant of the Hessian, again. But now I will write the Hessian as, remember, my function was the, the p-spin model. So let me call this p-spin model hp minus something which was, uh, with the right normalization, uh, lambda. This is now the, the Hessian of my function x1 to the k, the spike. So I have the Hessian, the second derivative gives me a k, k minus 1, x1 to the k minus 2. And then this plays a role only in the left, top left corner of the matrix, right? The, the function x1 to the k, it's Hessian, has only one coordinate. So this is what you have, the, this uh, one, one here, absolute value, and then indicator function of whatever else, conditioned by the fact that the function f is zero. I don't want to, but so you know, everybody can look at, I mean, can come to that point of the computation easily. You compute a Hessian. And remember, my function was a p-spin plus the function x1 to the k, multiplied by a constant. So the Hessian of that is easy. It's the Hessian of the p spin, and then the Hessian of x1 to the k is k, k minus 1, x1 to the k minus 2. All right? In the top left corner, that's this thing. So in the end, what you have to understand is this object, right? Conditioned by the gradient 0. But when you look at it, this is a simple thing. It's just, a, this is, of course, the, the, what you have to understand in the end is, uh, something of the following form, expectation of absolute value of determinants of a GOE of size n minus 1 minus here a normal variable because that's what it is, this, uh, this guy here. Remember, it's a GOE shifted by the value. Here I, didn't spe I could specify the value, but I didn't specify the value. The value is called u up there. So this, uh, this value is a Gaussian. So this thing is a Gaussian. And then you have minus a certain simple function 
direct method what one. Okay, and then indicator of index equal L, for instance, indicator that this value is smaller than some function V. That's what we need to understand. Right? So you see where this is, right? The, I already told you the Hessian of a GOE, of a P spin, is essentially a GOE shifted by the value. But here you have this thing in the top left corner. Right, which is this guy. I call it theta x, this four, this thing. Okay, so we have a GOE shifted with a spike in the top left corner. And then you have to condition on the index and maybe on the value. Delta 1, 1 is just the Kronecker symbol. It's the matrix. Okay, if you want, it's this. Delta 1, 1, take it as the matrix 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay. That's of course the only place where the spike acts. The Hessian has only a coordinate there. Why is a Gaussian random variable with a certain variance that I can compute here? Let me call it T. Okay. It's the it's essentially the level. Remember the this Hessian is just the GOE shifted by the level times the identity. And this level is a Gaussian variable. Okay, I could fix it. I could condition by it. It would not make a big difference. Okay, so that's. So yeah, so this is. I have this. This this s small than u. This v should be u or something. You know. So you fix the level. You fix the range for the level. You fix the index, and this is what you have to compute in the end. It's, yeah, it put theta equals zero. This is exactly the p-spin, naturally, right? Here, if you forget this. But the pure p-spin. The pure p-spin, yes. Okay. It's a constant if you fix the level. Here, I could fix the level, and so I will tell you, if you want, I can tell you what y is, okay? But uh, I can tell you what this variance is. That's a deterministic number. Right? If, you, if you want really to write the same way, you condition. But here, look at the difference. Here, I, I didn't put the integral on the value. I could. Right? And then I would fix here uh, the, in this thing here, I would fix here. Uh, I could here, condi even here, I could condition by this y. Right? And then this would become a constant. All right? So let's see. Yes? Where there is no correlation between what and what? Oh, that's a beautiful fact of isotropic fields. So l let me say that again. That's what makes these things much simpler than stationary fields, for instance. So if you take a stationary field, in particular, the variance is constant. Right? This imposes that the function and the gradient are orthogonal. Right? As I explained, expectation of f squared equals constant. If you differentiate, you find that expectation of f grad f is zero. So f and grad f are always independent. So in fact, this conditioning here is never very painful. But you can find that the gradient and the hash and the, the the gradient and the Hessian in this case, because are also isotropic, are also uh, independent in uh, isotropic models. And so finally, the Hessian only depends on the value. They are not independent. And the Hessian depends on the value and how? Just by a shift. That's what it is. Okay? So that's we saw la in, the, in the thing on the p spin model. So in the end, what do you have to compute? You have to compute this. Right? Now it's a random matrix problem. Forget everything else. We have a random matrix problem. You need to compute the characteristic polynomial, essentially, of a GOE spiked. Right? So, what is the BBP transition? It tells you when you put a spike, then the eigenvalue created by the spike will or will not get out of the semicircle. And by the way, here's a remark, a side remark. 
because I, I'm discussing with some of you, I've realized that kind of a wrong picture was emerging. There is something extremely remarkable in this transition. When, let me draw it the way Surya drew it, and the way it appeared, in fact, which was for the, um, so that you will recognize what we were discussing. It appeared first not with a semicircle, but with the Festo Marchenko or Wishart distribution, right? And the view was if you had, this is pure noise. This is the spectrum of a sample covariance matrix, right, where you have only noise. That is, you don't have a signal to find in the covariances. But then imagine that there is one variance which is higher than the others, right? Now this would create a spike, which is, let's say, here some value. And here you have the, this top number here, let's call this A, let's call this B. These two are fun A and B are function of the ratio, little n over capital N, whatever you call them. Well, this is what, what Surya called alpha, I think. Right? This is the number of sample versus the dimension. And B too. Let's say, or let me call this A minus and A plus. They are well-known function. And so, and then if you have a spike, so the, the way this was understood was like you have the C of noise, and when the C of noise retreats, right, if you have more sample, for instance, this noise will be less wide, then you will see an, uh, the spike coming out, like a rock being abandoned by the C, right? That's a completely wrong picture. That's not at all what happens, right? It's same. So that was for now. I, I, here I mentioned what the picture you've seen, and here is the picture we are dealing with. With you have a semicircle. So you remember in the usual normalization, the semicircle has a radius two. And so you could think of the same thing: is my spike gives an eigenvalue which is here larger than 2, then it will come out. If it's smaller, it will, it will be swallowed by the C. Of course, this 2 here depends on the radius of the semicircle depends on the variance of your GOE, of your element. So if you increase this variance, this thing will increase. And at some point when the variance, if this, you consider this as noise, when the variance is too big, it will cover this, and then you will not be able to recover this spike, right? wrong. That's not what happens, because you remember that the threshold for the BBP transition is 1, not 2. Okay, so there's a thing which is well known, which is called a push-out effect. So you can detect a spike. So here I I don't, I don't want to give the values here because they are complex, they depend on this alpha. Here, that's very simple, right? It's e easy to remember. This is one. So if, I put, if you put a spike of size one, even though the C of noise has width goes to two, the spike will come out, one plus something, okay? So that's very good news. Right, so you can recover. So why? That seems very strange. Remember that the, the spike is lambda plus 1 over lambda. Right? So, of course, when lambda is larger than 1, this is larger than 2. Right? And the, the naive guess that we'll have in our head is that this spiked eigenvalue should be lambda. If it were lambda, then the threshold would be 2, right? Because for lambda to be uh, above 2, there is no, no room. But when it's lambda plus 1 over lambda, then you have more room, okay? Of course, when lambda is very large, like in the example that Surya was explaining where, you know, this lambda was of size n or square root n, I mean, diverging, then, of course, you don't care about this 1 over lambda. Essentially, the spike is the eigenvalue you fed the system. But when lambda is smaller in this regime where there is a transition, in fact, the spike that comes out is very different. I mean, there is this element here. Okay? So that's just a parenthesis that I, I wanted to insist 
just so that you remember that there is more power to this detection thing than that than it, that you could think. Yes. So the of lambda, um, lambda yes, when it's larger than one. Okay. So if you add a spike size lambda, you show you see this lambda c, which is then that's why the threshold is one. Okay. Yes, yes, absolutely. This is what it is. So if you compute the, poten the Coulomb potential created by this and you add one, you, you will find it easily. This is, in fact, this, was, this type of thing, I mean, this is called the BBP transition, and I'm part of some of the Bs here. But this, the fact that the spike could get out was obvious, in fact, through this argument. Uh, what, what, uh, so this position was kind of easy to guess. What the BBP transition does is more, more precise things, like saying that the, the true eigenvalue you will find at lambda n will fluctuate Gaussianly here. But don't believe that it's always Gaussian. For instance, imagine you do the following thing. You put a double spike, right? So if you have two spikes like this, and they are one is above threshold, one is below, one will get out, the other one will stay in the C, in the noise. Now if both are above threshold, you will see both out there, and they will both fluctuate Gaussianly. But if they are both the same and above threshold, if you inject a double eigenvalue, they will get out exactly at this position, but what are their fluctuations? or a triple, or a quadruple, not Gaussian, okay? So it's, the result is not completely trivial. So what, in fact, it's pretty easy to guess. I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent here. But imagine this, what happens here, you have this double eigenvalue. When it gets out of the noise, it behaves like a random matrix of size two. So the fluctuation of these two eigenvalues is unlike the fluctuation of, the, of a GOE of size 2. Right? And that's not Gaussian. So why did we recover Gaussian here? Because that's behaved like a GOE of size 1. A GOE of size 1 is Gaussian. Right? But a GOE of size 2, if you look at its, random va its eigenvalues, they're not Gaussian. Right? Interestingly, now you could put a diverging thing, what you will see coming out, right? imagine that you have an eigenvalue with large multiplicity. What you will see coming out here will be a small semicircle, a small GOE, naturally. Right? So there is a, a certain richness to this. It's not completely uh, just this computation. You, you can do the whole, all that has been done by, uh, by the P in BBP, by Sandrine Péché and her collaborators. All right. And by the way, BBP initially was for this thing in the complex case. And if one wants to be fair, it was extended to the real case, which is the most important thing for what we're discussing here, by this B, bike, and, uh, and gosh, I forgot, Silverstein. All right, so now let's stay with BBP for a moment. BBP is not enough to help you do this. You need more, right? You need BBP, but in a more detailed version. Why? Because this looks like, remember how we did it when we had no spike. We said this is like exponential of log of it, right? So it's exponential of n times 1 over n, sum of, the, of this value minus the eigenvalue, absolute value, of GOE. So it's the log potential, exponential of n times the log potential. Right? So we have to understand how a spike changes this log potential, but in a very detailed manner, because it's inside a, an exponential n. Right? So small. So we have to understand the large deviation of this thing. And in fact, here you have, th if you use 
The same trick I explained last time, the Zellbert trick that we use with our finger, you can write this as an expectation under a GOE of size n. Now, by adding one more variable, and you find something very similar to what we have before, lambda L square minus all sorts of things. All these are constant. I don't really want to. Uh, indicator of this uh, lambda L being in a certain set. Let me call it G. But then comes something else. Then comes something. So all that looks really like what we had before. And then comes an, uh, an orbital integral. where this, this big thing, let's say, let me defini define it in general, I m of a number of theta, x1, x m, is the integral on the orthogonal group of size m of exponential n, and this value theta, times u diagonal, so this will remind something to Surya, diagonal x u star, 1, 1, du. So this is an orbital integral. You integral on the group. You integrate on the group. Exponential n, this is a number, which is here. And then you take the matrix made of, the diagonal matrix made of these elements, multiply it, conjugate it by a random, put it in a random uh, position under the orthogonal group. This is what you do here. You conjugate it by the element of the group. You take its top left coordinate, 1, 1, and then that gives you a number, you integrate. You know, the normal co uh, orbital integrals are things with traces. Here is just one element. So that's a, that's a complicated object. This notation here means that I, I don't, this hat means that this variable is missing. Okay, big mess, but you can work with it. So in fact, you can write that this behave. So this, in fact, as I said, boils down to the fact that, so when you compute all that, what you're doing is you're, in fact, proving a large deviation what is behind all this, this computation, is a large deviation principle for the top eigenvalue. Let's say here I'm on the right, I could be on the left of the spiked Wigner matrix, right? That's what we're looking at. So you remember so that when the matrix is not spiked for the computation for the p-spin, this was the important thing. The probability that the top eigenvalue, when there is no spike, the probability that the top eigenvalue, when there is no spike, the top eigenvalue, the correct position is supposed to be here. The probability that it moves to the left is exponential minus n squared. That it moves to the right is exponential minus n times a function that we can compute. But now if there is a spike, what's going on? If there is a spike here. So the typical value of your top eigenvalue should be here, the typical position. Now you want to understand what is the probability that it moves. That in fact, you find your your uh, top eigenvalue here or here. Not in the regime of fluctuation, where we know they are Gaussian. Not that it's roughly around here, but that it is really far from it. Okay, so there is such a thing, and as I said, this is due to Milan Maida. And the rate function for it, so it's in the scale n, and the rate function, I will call L lambda, is, um, so of course when we are in this regime, when the spike is out, uh, is, of, let's say, W. So remember what that means. That means the probability to find the top eigenvalue at the position W is exponential minus N times this function, right? And this function is one half as of integral from lambda C to W. Integral of y squared minus 4 
dy minus uh, uh, lam uh, the strength of my uh, w minus lambda c plus one four I'm not so I forgot about this four but it must be that minus lambda c square okay so you find that this uh, okay that's something you can compute using this um, orbital integrals you can compute all that and this is what Milan Maida does. But look at the formula, it's interesting. So of course when, uh, when there's no spike, lambda is zero, this disappears, and this disappears, and we get again what we had before. But, uh, and notice of course that this thing is, is minimum at lambda c, naturally, where it, where it, where it is zero. So naturally, of course, the most probable position is here, so the rate function is vanishes here. And so you see here you have different terms. You have a term that really comes from the fact that this thing wants to be close to lambda c. And you also have a repulsion here coming from the, from the bulk. All right, when you put this information in this whole thing, you find the formula I gave you. Uh, about this uh, complexity. And I will just stop there. You, that's painful enough. And then when you, and in particular after a, a night at the bar. So when you, once you analyze this formula, which is uh, what it is, you find all these movies that I describe in terms of the position of the complexity. Okay? Forget what this formula, I mean, this, is, this whole thing is beautiful. There are deep things hidden behind this, but let's forget that. When I say beautiful for a mathematician, usually it means painful. Um, the, the important thing is that the, the take-home message that I really want to, 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 to make clear, I, I said, is the Katz-Rice formula, the Katz-Rice dictionary, I agree, in fact, with Leo when he said that it was a simple formula. It's just a dictionary brings back this complexity transition just to a BBP transition. And if you think what it means, it means the following. When you take a, a typical uh, critical point of your function at a given height and on a given parallel, this is what we do over there, this thing has a Hessian. And this Hessian is a spike GOE, a shifted spike GOE. Right? You have the shift with Y and a spike. And it's just where, just the position of the of its uh, edge eigenvalue that plays a role. Here I discussed everything with the right end. Of course, you understand that over there might be the left end because we are looking at the we are interested in the minima, not in the maxima. Okay, but it's a, a completely symmetric picture. All right, so that's that's the dictionary. So the BBP rules this thing completely. All right. Yeah. To what? to the maximum eigenvalue what? Oh, I gave that yeah, last time. That's the, what I call lambda zero. So you put la lambda equals zero like this. And uh, so lambda c becomes two. If I'm not mistaken, this must, because lambda, when lambda equals zero, the top eigenvalue becomes two, right? Lambda c becomes two when you have no spike. So if normally, if you, if you put, if I'm not mistaken, and if you put, so lambda equals zero, this term disappear. Here you put lambda c equal two, this is w squared minus four. This should be what I call lambda zero, I hope. What? No, but it's also two for any lambda smaller than one, right? The, to the top eigenvalue is two for any spike below one. All right. Okay, you're asking a delicate question, in fact, behind this. Here I describe what happens. Okay, you asked it, so if you don't like this, he's responsible. 
the, the, um, if you spike it with a lambda which is smaller than 1, right? So we know then the BBP transition, you cannot see the spike. It's as if there was nothing. In fact, wrong too. The large deviation feels it. Right? Of course, it doesn't mean that you can, you can really, because feeling the rate function of the large deviation is complicated, but, but there is a small influence. I didn't write to write it. It becomes a little complicated. But there is a little influence when lambda is smaller than one, but not zero. Uh, so this this is valid, in fact, only when lambda is larger than one. When the spike goes gets out, when lambda is smaller than one, there is a different formula. Okay. So enough with that, I think. So let me go now to to why this uh, uh, long computation could be informative. Of course, what we did here was to make one computation, because we could, but, and because it's uh, interesting in itself. But So more generally, why do we have, so I think this, uh, so this thing is called the topological transition, right? What we just uh, described here. And as I said, this was, so let me say again what the history of this might be. So this topological transition, at least in my understanding, maybe Pierre can contradict me here, I think is really due to uh, Jan Fyodorov. I mean, he's in 2004. And he did it in a much rougher way, but there was still already this transition. So his picture was not on the sphere, not a spike tensor, not a P-spin model. It was a simple thing. It was take a function V, which is a, uh, you know, in Rn, which is a quadratic potential, okay, so the simplest possible, that will be the spike. And then now take a function, uh, okay, h of x, which will be Gaussian, let's say mean zero, just to simplify things, and the covariance is, so he took a general model here. The covariance is a two-point function. This is what Pierre called R0. And he took a, an isotropic uh, stationary model. So this is a function of the distance, right? So the, again, mathematicians have classified why this, what this R0 can be in the 40s and 50s. It's an old story, okay? So we know all the possible R0s. Because, of course, you have conditions on that. Otherwise, this, this won't be a, a covariance function. Yeah, but you can describe way more. Right? They have a long story about what they are. In fact, if now you, you asked, oh, uh, I'm sorry, here I put the stationary means this. It's a function of the vector. Isotropic means a function of the norm. Right? By the way, let's, <laughs> okay, so, Let's do the same thing on the sphere. And let me ask, you take a function on the sphere, which is Gaussian, random, mean zero, let's say, like this, and isotropic, in the sense that the covariance is a function on the distance of the sphere, right? And you assume that this function doesn't change with n, right? Because, of course, if your model changes from one dimension to the next, what can you do? What is this class of functions? What are all the possible uh, models of Gaussian function which are isotropic on the sphere? Interesting, this was solved in 38. And in math, as an exercise in harmonic analysis, and the answer is mixtures of p-spin models. And that's all. That's a theorem. That's why when I talk to mathematicians, I don't say the word p-spin model. I don't have to. It just So if you think of it epistemologically, this is very interesting. Because how did physics get to mixture of spherical p-spin models? Right? First, started with disorder. 
Edwards Anderson, whatever, then mean field is simpler. So you get to Sherrington Kirkpatrick. Okay, then you say, okay, Sherrington Kirkpatrick is a bit complicated and singular. Maybe we can introduce P interaction rather than two. This is still hard, the P spin model. All right, and you can mix them. But then you say sphere is much simpler. Okay? So that's, of course, that's not very important for physics, but let me just tell you that this way, physics just rediscovered uh, 60 years later or 50 years later the same class of model, and that's the only class of model. Okay? So when studying piece mixtures of P spin model on the sphere, you are just studying the absolutely general model of a, of a random function, Gaussian function on the sphere. There is nothing else. Okay, but you have to put mixtures, of course, to have the whole thing. On the sphere. With covariance, not the With covariance. Not the claim, the fact. <laughs> no, there's a difference. And it's a fact since 1938, so, you know. So... <laughs> so you take you take a, 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 fun a random function on the sphere, yeah. right? Let's say mean zero, because the mean you can put whatever. Then it uh, if n and it's cover it's isotropic. Its covariance only dis depends on the distance. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No, that uh, this is general. Of course, the difference is that the coefficient of the mixture would be different. Of course. <laughs> But the, so you don't assume smooth, you just assume a function, and then you will have, and the covariance is isotropic. So in terms of physics, what does it mean to be isotropic? The distance of the sphere is, of course, the same. Being a function of the distance is the same as being a function of the overlap, right? Because of the sp on the sphere, the distance and the angle is essentially the same thing. So if you take a function whose covariance is a function of the overlap, it has to be a mixture of p spins. No, infinite. So of course, if you want to be smooth, you want the coefficient of this mixture to decay fast enough. If you take a crazy mixture, it will be a distribution, whatever. But, but if, if you say smooth, you will have a, and you can analyze how it has to go down. But let's, uh, let's leave that. So the class of mixtures of p spin Spherical is the general class of isotropic models on the sphere. I just sh thought I should share that. And by the way, the, the guy who made this claim a fact is called Schoenberg. All right, so, yeah. I'm sorry? Why would they Catch Rice, I mean, this is the same time that Rice did it just later. They were, the, these two things didn't come together because, you know, there was a time where you did statistics in dimension two, one, five, never a million. And so there was no reason really to study these things. And so since you, are, okay, th I'm sorry, now I, I sound like grandpa t talking at the, but he provoked me. Uh, uh, you could ask the same question about counting the number of critical points. Uh, here, what is a p-spin, pure? It's simply a random homogeneous polynomial of degree p. Okay? Now, and so I'm looking at the random homogeneous polynomial of degree p on a sphere of, a sphere of size n, and we let n go to infinity. You could ask the other question. Let's take a random homogeneous polynomial of degree p on dimension and size, on the sphere dimension of size n. Instead of taking random homogeneous polynomial, you take a spherical harmonic, which are a combination of those, right? And now instead of letting n go to infinity, you let p go to infinity. That mathematicians have been studying forever, okay? And so in particular, and this is linked to very deep things. You now, the, if the dimension is fixed, now, this, what are the spherical harmonics? They are the eigenvectors of the Laplacian. So now you can generalize this to a, a different setting, which is take a Riemannian manifold, a family of Riemannian, um, uh, I'm sorry, a fixed Riemannian manifold, look at the Laplacian on it. That's a completely, I mean, that's a workhorse of geometry and, and of course, of, of quantum mechanics, if you want. It's just you look at the quantum mechanics on a, on a manifold, 
with zero potential, but your manifold is, let's say, compact, like a sphere. And now you look at the, the p going to infinity would simply mean you look at the eigenvalues of the spectrum of this, the eigenvectors, and you look at the, at, at the level lines, for instance, the critical points or the level lines. They are more interested in the level line because the level lines of, of eigenvectors of the, of the Laplacians are important things. And so you look at the topology of these level lines when p goes to infinity, that is when, when you go inside this, uh, deep in the spectrum. Okay? And this is, you know, for instance, this has very serious consequences in number theory. This is the work of people like Sarnak or, you know, uh, today. So that's a deep thing. But people were doing that, looking at this limit, n fixed, p going to infinity. So just to say that they were still curious, but that was a natural limit. This limit, p fixed, n going to infinity, was not that interesting. Even though, if you look at Schoenberg's paper, so the very old papers, 38, 42, because of course he did it on the sphere, he looked at it on other things, his goal was precisely to build the kind of ultimate, what we would call the ultimate piece spin. That is, the limit in some strange topology of these guys on the infinite dimensional sphere. Right? So that is, and very large. But he was not trying to understand the craziness of the landscape. He was trying to understand this limiting object. On inf okay? Enough, I mean, enough. Uh, uh, so let's go back to here. So what Fyodorov did, no, 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 it's on Rn. That's what Fyodorov did in R. There was no reason to be on the sphere. Okay, it's on Rn. Yeah, so for the moment, let, let me be cool about that. R0 is nice. Then we will see, he will have to assume that R0 has four derivatives. Let me not go, go there. So, this, so, you know, this is something like a generalization of the p-spin model on the sphere, but on Rn. And now, the, he looked at the function, let's say, f of x, which would be lambda v of x plus h of x. Right, with proper normalization. So that's the spike model. Right? And, of course, if you here, when the spike is zero, the model is a little painful because this thing is... Gaussian on the, and stationary on the whole of Rn, so you have an infinite number of critical points. Right? But of course, what this uh, quadratic potential does, it's exactly that. You add this plus this, and, we, and then we will see that there is, so what he proved was a rough version of this topological transition, which is when lambda is small enough, then the complexity, he looked at the total complexity the mean total complexity, right? So he looked at let me call it, I think he calls it sigma of lambda, that's the mean of the total number of critical points. So here you don't fix the index, you don't fix the value, you cannot compute the number of minima, you just compute all critical points. And so, of course, when you are far enough, the gradient of V will be big and will kill the critical points of this guy. Okay? But when you are kind of closer, you may have many more. So here it's not a compact thing like the sphere, but this quadratic potential plays a similar role. He looked at this, and then he proved that there was a lambda critical where when, this is, when the spike is not strong enough, this is positive. And when it's larger, it's zero. Then he pushed it very far in the other direction. Many uh, generalized to something which is not quadratic and, and to models that are of different nature. And I mentioned already works with, uh, with Pierre and with uh, Jean-Philippe Bouchot and others, and, and Korojenko. All right, so you see this, first, th this measure is rather rough. It's the total number. Right, where we're, we're giving more detailed thing, but the important thing here is that there are only two phases. It's complex or it's not complex. What I'm saying is that, in fact, in, the, in this case, it will be true too, is that there are three phases. Inside the phase where it's complex, 
there are two phases. There are the phase of complexity where you don't, you cannot find the spike. You have, you're not correlated to that in some sense, the spike here being zero. And there is a phase where all those critical points are kind of uh, close to the, are here, close to, the, to, the, to zero, right? In the one of those bands, like I was describing on the sphere. So you have this intermediate complexity phase, which also exists here. And this is, and I believe that's kind of very general. You always have, maybe not always, I shouldn't say that, but uh, a phase where you have, so if you, want to, if you want to think of this model closer to a model like that we had on the sphere, right? Think of this, instead of putting a potential here, look at this, simply this function h on a big ball, not a sphere, on a big <coughs> ball. Then typically, when you have no spike, all the critical points are on the edge of the ball. The edge of the ball here plays the role of the equator, right? Because in high dimension, if you take a point uniformly on a ball, it will be on the edge. But then, so the first phase of complexity, when you have a lot of complexity, is whether there is a spike or not, a small spike will not move this. You will have this exponentially many critical points on the edge, and you, cannot, you don't see anything closer to zero than if it was uniform. And then you have an intermediate <coughs> phase where inst you still have an exponentially many criti uh, critical points, but instead of being on the edge, they are now on a radius which is smaller, which entropically is not favorable. Right? If you didn't have this, it wouldn't, the spike, it would not happen. And then if the spike is strong enough, you find essentially one minimum very close to, the, to zero. And so if you're trying to, you know, to run the minimization algorithm, you should be happy there. Okay, so that's this topological transition. And I believe that this topological transition, in so that we've, we've just seen an example where we can, I could have done it in this case, but I thought presenting spike tensor seems more interesting. Ask Jan. No, no, I don't want to speak. Uh, in, uh, for me, it's a very natural thing. You just, uh, uh, you have something. You want to see if you can recover. No, then, then it was expanded too. So let me tell you what has been done later. For instance, what Bouchot did with, uh, and with Jan and this thing was look at the case where the covariance, instead of being nice and smooth, is logarithmic. Right? And it's a completely different game and covers a very interesting problem. But let's not go there. Did that come from Bouchot's trap model? No, 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 no. The Bouchot trap model I liked a lot and I can s detect it. But, uh, so, uh, so let's go now to th this topological transition conjecture, of course, for statistics, right? for inference. What does that mean? Spike tensor is an example, a not very successful one because in the end you always have this terrible complexity phase. But in general, so what is the problem? You have, you have a sample of uh, IID random variable, that's your sample, drawn from uh, a distribution, let's say P, which you don't know. That's the usual thing you do in statistics, right? on, let's say, Rn, right? And then with whatever, so of course, the usual statistics is m very, very large and n equal 5. But of course, you'll, that won't, that's not what we'll do. And then you have whatever method that you want to do parametric estimation of this distribution. So you, you construct a likelihood function, a loss function, whether you're Bayesian or not, or you do something of that nature. I don't want to get there. And so you build a model, of course. And this is the loss function with the parameter theta. So your parametric model, theta is in, so here, in fact, you have in dimension d. A priori, you have a, a three dimension, m, n, and d. Typically, d is like n or 2n or 3n or n over 2, whatever. 
And so what you just do is look at this loss function, however you built it, and on your sample. Right? Maybe you average that. And you call that, of course, the empirical risk. Hat statistics means empirical. Okay, so, and what you do, of course, is you want to minimize this. Right? Of course, the true risk is, this is the empirical risk, the oracle, oracle whatever, the, the, the true risk is the expectation of this and the P. Right? But you don't know P, so you cannot compute it. So then you want to minimize this function. If it's a likelihood, you may want to optimize, but then put a negative sign, to maximize, but then put a negative sign. So the question is, how hard is it to find the minimum? And if you find a minimum, in statistics, you will call theta hat this minimum, which precisely tends to mean you expect that you always find the same type of thing. Whereas, of course, in what we saw, you could have very random estimator. And so an estimator will be a minimizer of this. There are two things. There's the value. You have to compute the minimum of this. In, in theta, in your domain of your theta. So that's one thing. That's the performance. And then you have to compute maybe the place where the minimum is achieved. And that's the estimator. So old-fashioned statistics is... D or N, let's imagine for a moment that they are the same, is small. You have three parameters, five. And M is very large. That's Fisher statistics. So, of course, then you have no problem. By the law of large numbers, this converges to the true risk. This landscape will be, the fluctuation will be Gaussian. This landscape will be very nice it's if, if the true risk, so you will always, always assume that the true risk is a smooth function, a nice function. You don't want to do estimation if your true risk is crazy. Right? If your true risk is a p-spin, do something else. Right? So if your, if your true uh, loss function is a pure noise, then... So of course you assume that the true risk is nice. And so the usual statistics is M is very large, and you find it pretty easily. There's a long literature on that. What happened something like 10 years ago with uh, Candace and Tao and are situations where, you know, for sparse things, situations where M and N can both be very large. Okay? And you still have efficient estimation of all sorts. But they are, my view is that they are in a position, all these things, uh, and so as I was mentioning, there's beautiful work recently uh, in all directions, uh, Flor Lenka, but also uh, uh, Andrea Montanari, for instance, and his collaborators, showing that situations where the problem is simple. In fact, there is very recent work by Andrea Montanari of situations of that type where he shows that the landscape is simple, that there is a unique minimum. He shows more than that. He shows that not only is this function nice, but you know, when, uh, when M and N are large, the, the gradient and the Hessian of the function converge to the true thing to a smooth and nice thing. So, of course, it means that your minimization algorithm will, will, deal, will have no problem. It will meet none of these crazy things. Because, you know, remember, if, if the function is like this and you had a crazy function like that, it can converge to this, but its gradient will not. Of course, that's what we use. Right? The gradient will be crazy. So what Andrea proves is that in certain regimes, this doesn't happen. But what are those regimes? There are regimes typically when M is like N log N. So very large compared to M. Right? So this corresponds to a spike which is in our picture which is big. So the system is really simple. But I, can, I, know, I don't know, I, many people probably, I imagine that the, the three phases of the topological transition essentially are always there. And so these three phases mean that there is a phase, a simple phase that I just described, where things will be good. You will find a unique minimizer, which is like in our spike tensor, this thing close to the top, to the spike. 
And so you will do consistent estimation because different, estimator, diff different runs will give you the, always the same estimation. The performance will be very good. Everything's cool. It doesn't mean that it's easy to do it, but it's possible. And there is a phase where you will find nothing. The thing will be super complex. And even if you, when you find a minimum, it will take forever to find one decent local minimum. Uh, the, it, will have, it will be absolutely not correlated with your signal. And there should be an intermediate phase where you find something which is correlated. But this intermediate phase is really interesting because then it means that you don't need as much of a signal-to-noise ratio as you don't need as much of an M. Of course, your sample could be much smaller. Right. And I believe that's exactly the regime in which machine learning works. So machine learning is exactly this structure. Right. So what is theta in machine learning is just the collection of all the synaptic weights between layers and possibly of the thresholds of your ReLU functions. So big, big dimension. What are the XIs? They are the images. I mean, the usual task is there a cat in this picture. So the XIs are your, the, the images you feed your thing. Let's say it's supervised learning. The, what is the L? It's just the error. In the end, your thing says there is, with this configuration of weights, there is a cat or there is no cat, let's say. And, and it's supervised, and somebody says yes or no, and so you measure the number of errors. That's your loss function. And I, so why do I say that we must be in this regime? Maybe I'm completely wrong. And in fact, this is, you know, this paper was quoted by Surya, and then a few people asked me, but in this paper that uh, jointly but with Jan Luka and myself and uh, others, Anna Choromanska and there is a part wi which describes a possible map between these problems of machine learning and p-spin model. Right? Don't read that. This is crap. <laughs> okay? uh, uh, this is public. Right? Uh, uh, it may, may not be crap. But, uh, let me withdraw that. It's, I don't understand it. Okay? So, so what, what the, don't read that part. What is important is, why do I pre suggest it that it's possible that we are in this intermediate phase is that the signature of this phase is that when you do estimation, when you do minimization, you find something which is never the same. It's random because you have all this complexity, all these possible local minima. But the performance concentrates. So the position of the estimator does not concentrate. If you do a, a thousand run, you will find different estimators, which here means different configuration of your, of your neural net, of the synaptic weights and the thresholds. But their performance will be very close. Right? That's what happened in this complexity. You have, remember in my picture, you have this wall. They are all, the value is kind of concentrated. Right? And this is what seems to happen. In those cases, in, in machine learning, if you, uh, I don't know what Surya's experience is with Google, but I can say what I've seen in things was, uh, that I, w I was told by Facebook. The, uh, the configuration is never the same which again is a big problem for statisticians. How do you believe an estimator that just is never the same? And, and the, but the performance is always the same. Yes? No. Yeah, so that's, that, uh, that's complexity. So I put it in this framework. If you had only one minimum, when you are in the regime when M is large enough, this disappears. But so it's precisely because you have so this complexity, this intermediate. It cannot be the first phase because then, uh, the, then your network would not recognize if there is a cat or not in the end. The performance would just be n noise. But I thought equation counting just explains that, right? Because if you compute the gradient, you have very few examples and many, many unknowns. So the yeah, I agree. I agree. That's, but that's, that's what I'm saying. This picture of the three phases is relevant here. And they don't want, so they you could say, but why don't they go to the phase where things are nicer? So it's not for me to say why they don't, but of course I ask this question. First, one has to have an idea of the dimensions, that's what Surya is saying, of these things. And what they do, n can be 10 to the 8, and m may be 10 to the 5, right? So if you want to have m like n log n, you know, your databases should be, tremendous and the cost of supervising would be enormous. But that's not the real reason in fact. The real reason is that they say, as Surya has explained quite a few times, 
it would be bad for this would be fantastic for the training error but very bad for the generalization error right? so you would learn your sample extremely well but then you will be very unflexible to learn other things so in some sense they like this I, I'm claiming something crazy here which is that this intermediate complexity is in fact good right that's, uh, that's what I've been told all right so I don't have real example for that, but let's think, of course, if you want to think of one simple model which is not uh, spike tensor or, or uh, machine learning, which is really difficult, think of this as a mixture of Gaussians. Right? You think you want, let's imagine that your, um, your parameter is you, j just, uh, you have a mixture of Gaussians. And even this is, for instance, what Andrea does, where Andrea and his collaborators does, do. It's a mixture of Gaussian. Let's say you simplify by saying it's a half and a half, and they have the same variance. And the only parameter is just the, the mean. Right? So you have two vectors. That seems to be a simple model. So there you prove that when m is very large, large enough, then the model is simple. But so typically the, the phase picture that it would draw is the true, you have two points like this in a large dimensional space, which are the two things where you can end. Your two. And there is here, and he explains that very well, there is this kind of mid plane here, which is where you have critical points, and which you have to escape. So he explained that when it is large enough, so you have a basin of attraction here, a basin of attraction here. So he's talking complexity, really. And, yeah, but, and you can escape this thing. So this is exactly the same picture as the spike thing. Okay, these two guys are my pole. And this thing is the equator. Right? So when you're on this thing, essentially you, have, you see nothing. Your estimation is terrible. Right? So I imagine that in this model, there, there is a topological transition where you would get something around here and something around here, like this two uh, uh, you know, uh, bands I was describing, which you could obtain at a lower M. Now, how would you prove things like this? How would, do this whole pro would you do this whole program of studying complexity for things like this? I don't know, in fact. But maybe you have all the tools. Okay. Very, very good student. So she's saying what I was willing to hear. Catch rice, right? Begin by catch rice. You know the trick. Begins by catch rice. Look at the random matrix model you get. Then be super smart because you have to understand it in a regime of large deviation. Right? Not only convergence to a semicircle or fluctuation, but more, as you've seen. And then you will see a transition. You, will can, you can compute. This is just what I've done in two simple models, the p-spin and the p-spin with a spike. Okay, so what are the problems here is that this thing is not Gaussian. So why is that something like a spike thing? This is like the mean of this, which is the true risk, plus, in this normalization, 1 over square root of m, time, let me call it g of theta, g like Gaussian. Right? This is roughly this. Right? So this really looks like our spike question, <coughs> the, the topological transition I just explained from Jan, or what we did. You have a nice smooth function, which is the true risk. In this example, it's just a very nice function with minima here and here. And you add a Gaussian thing. This Gaussian, of course, the covariance of this Gaussian you can compute easily because the covariance of this is the covariance of that. And the covariance of that you can compute easily from the L. So you have a covariance, a Gaussian structure on a very high dimensional manifold. Here are D. And here in this example, D is 2N. And uh, so probably what we did could work. Then you, you compute, you have to compute the Hessian of this guy, which will be a random matrix model. Not the GOE, mind you. More complicated. And then this random matrix model, you will spike it by the Hessian of this guy. So in the end, it will be a BBP transition. Right? This seems like a sound strategy. At least to me, but... Uh, Many problems there. First, it's not at all clear 
that the random matrix model you obtain here is tractable. First, this model, in this case, for instance, the mixture, is not isotropic, and in fact, it's not stationary. So we are not even in the case of a class of Fyodorov. So no big deal. You don't need stationarity to do anything. It's cat's rice, but it's just uh, makes it a little more complicated. Okay, you can still, computing the, the, the structure of the matrix model is not complicated. You have to compute the Hessian, the law of the Hessian. How do you compute? The Hessian would be a Gaussian matrix. How do you compute the law of a Hessian? You just need to compute its mean and its covariance. Computing the covariance of the Hessian is just differentiating the, the covariance enough times, four times. Right? So if you have the covariance of this guy, which comes from the information here, you, you have formally, after really painful computation of differentiation, the Hessian. Right? So all that seems cool. What are the problems? First, here I said Gaussian. But it's not true. This is Gaussian, you know. If I fix one point, one theta, I have one, these are real quantities, then true, yes, I have a central limit theorem. But to approximate the whole function in dimension n, when I have m sample by a Gaussian, this is asking very much to the central limit theorem. There's a huge part of, of statistics that does that, strong central limit strong Gaussian approximation, functional, as they say, that is in high dimension or in, in function spaces. Not clear that it works in the regime we want. All right, so that's a problem. Second, you could say, yeah, but I don't care because I could apply cats rice As Leo was saying, this is a simple formula. <coughs> so if you're not too shy about mathematical technicalities, you can, in fact, apply it to, to this random field, even if it's not Gaussian. Right? That is, you write it like this. This thing is not exactly Gaussian, but you can still apply cat's rice formula. Right? So the, where is the catch? That, remember, in cat's rice, you have to condition by the fact that the, that the function <coughs> is, is critical. Gauss, in Gaussian things, con conditioning is, is obvious. It's a linear operation. Right? Con if you have a, a, a couple which is Gaussian, if you condition this by that, you just change the covariance by a linear thing. Right? But when it's not Gaussian, you don't, at least I don't know how to start. Right? So there it becomes a little difficult. Ah, but you could say yes, but in the end, at this, when I do this computation, I do it in, I don't need to know the Gaussian approximation on the whole process. Maybe I need to know less where this approximation will be good. I don't know. So all that is open, and you're welcome to try. But, um, Okay, so I wanted to talk about dynamics, but uh, I just have 10 minutes. So let me mention just very briefly a few things. And of course, if you, if you try and have a good idea, let me know. I would be very happy. To my knowledge, there is not much that has ever been done with cat's rice. I, I, I don't know enough, but with cat's rice in a non-Gaussian context, you know, in this approximation thing. So. No, I think it's, it's not on a manifold, so you can't even start. Soft spin, sure, sure. Yeah, so the question here is, can you apply the cat's rice ideas for discrete models? A priori, no, because I start with a manifold. I have to s define critical points. <coughs> Hessians. That's, that we did. That we did. So, okay, since I'm pushed in the math direction, I answer in the math direction. In fact, there is more theory for, for discrete spaces. That exists. The notion of critical points, Hessians, Morse inequalities, all that exists. But not for all discrete spaces. Discrete space needs to be good for, needs to be what is called a CW complex. Not need, I mean, this is too strong. You can do it in a CW complex. 
The problem with that, for instance, if you take Ising spin glasses, this is defined on the vertices of a cube. Right? The vertices of a cube are not a good space for, the, for most theory. Everything it doesn't make sense. If you extend this discrete object to the cube, not to the full cube, but to the discrete object, which is made of the vertices, the edges, the sides, the, the inner thing, right? Then this discrete object becomes a, C, becomes a CW complex, and you have more theory, and you could do cat's rice. Way more complicated. All these integrals would become uh, sums. Uh, the determinant of Hessian would become volume of polyhedra, Gaussian volume of polyhedra, a real mess, but there's a formula. The real problem when you do that, if you want to do that this way, is if you start from the, the SK model, or I don't know, it's P-spin model, on the ver it's defined on the vertices of the cube, so it's a function on the vertices of your cube. If you want to extend it to a function of the of this CW complex generated by the cube, how do you do that? Right? What is the natural extension? It means like you would have to define the SK model not only but on you know on spins configuration, which are the vertices of the cube, but on the edges between them, the sides, and all that. So okay, enough of that. One word about dynamics. So in five minutes. So let me just say in words that uh, there has been recent progress in math, essentially with, of course, physics has been doing that for a very long time. And a lot is known, but there's a recent interesting progress with Okosh Jagannath and uh, Reza Gesai, who are. So Reza is still a student at Courant, now Okosh is a postdoc at Harvard. And so let me say in words what, it, what happens there. So if you take a, uh, a spin glass, whatever, a piece being hard or soft, um, it's well known, of course, that the, at low temperature, temp the dynamics are slow. So how do you, and there are many, many different levels of uh, description of that that you can take. So w one way was to initially, and we've done that for years, was to try to really understand deeply aging. Aging is just tells you that there are so the time to equilibrium is exponential constant n, and that for any other, let's say, exponential cn, and you have a full range of exponential scales, exponential c prime n, where c prime is smaller than c, where the, the dynamic explores different levels of energies, and you have this uh, arc sine law which describes the, the aging phenomena. What is the probability that at a certain time and at a later time, you are essentially in the same configuration. So this is well understood in math uh, in terms of uh, what is called fractional kinetics, bouchot trap model. Um, but for sim this has been done very consistently, but for simple dynamics. Hard models, but simple dynamics. So dynamics that are reversible, but the one I call the bouchot trap, the bouchot dynamics, which is, which are just a time change of the standard random walk on the cube, for instance. There we know a lot for the p-spin. For We started with the REM. We went to the p-spin. We understand all this very beautiful structure. Totally irrelevant for the questions we're discussing now. Because as soon as your algorithm goes into these exponential time modes, then, then it's useless. But that was, of course, what we started with. There is recent progress to do that now for better dynamics, for metropolis dynamics. This is done in the REM now by Veronique Gerard and Yerji Czerny independently. And, and we, get, we find the same result. Even though the dynamics are way more complicated, we find the same thing, the same, the, this, the, this very long aging dynamics. And probably, I would bet that prob maybe Veronique will, even though this is a massive work, probably do it for the P-spins or things of that nature. There are results now on the other side of the spectrum that, were, that are, have been done a long time ago about the uh, dynamics of the, p see, let's say, spherical p-spin in short time. And then you find those equations that probably Leticia has mentioned, the 
the one I, I call the Cugliandolo Korshan equation. That's a strange feature of physics. You don't it seems to be hard to call things by the name of their authors. As long as, so as a mathematician, we do that all the time. So this is the Cugliandolo Korshan dynamics. And the equations. This tell you what happened in short time. But this does not relate in any relating these to the long time picture has always been a very hard problem. It's the so-called matching problem and in, in physics even. When I say hard here, it's not for a shy mathematician. It's hard even if you have all the methods of physics. And in fact, nobody really knows how to do that. So that's where we were. But here, what we did re recently was different, was we tried to really understand a much simpler thing, which we should have done a long time ago, but we couldn't, which is to really understand when is it that, so forget about all these long time, di sh sharp description of aging. Of course, at some point, we will probably still do it, but now take general nice dynamics, reasonable dynamics, metropolis dynamics, Glauber dynamics if you want on, on the cube, or Langevin dynamics on the sphere. Right? So the most reasonable dynamics you want. And uh, just ask yourself, wh when is it that the mixing time is, is exponential? Right? The, or not? So here there are all, f all, all sorts of ways to define mixing time. There is a, a usual way in, 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 in uh, in math, then there is the relaxation time. There, there, there's a little unfortunate thing here that the way it's defined in math, relaxation time, and in physics is not exactly the same. But anyway, so mixing time means essentially the worst possible starting point. Right? And roughly relaxation means starting from a decent point. Okay? So we, what we did there, we looked at this question, and of course we rediscovered, we didn't know it, of course, we rediscovered but rigorously something that is called the Franz Parisi potential. So let me explain what that is, which is nice. You know, you send your paper to Parisi, and he says, oh, it looks like Franz, uh, I, I don't understand what you do, but so then you write, uh, and then Silvio says, yes, it's uh, th this. So, but what is the Franz Parisi potential? So that's a theorem, and this one is deep and could not be, have been proven before last year because it's based on really hard work of Dmitry Penchenko and what is called the 2D Guerlanda Guerra bounds. But when I state it, it's very simple. If you take under any kind of reasonable spin glass model, it could be a, a spin glass with a spike, with a field, for instance. We didn't study there the spike case, but we could. If you take two replica, okay, chosen under the Gibbs measure at temperature T. And if you look at their overlap, right, this satisfies a quenched large deviation principle. Right? So the if you look at the probability, so this probability means I take the Gibbs measure. I don't know what's the notation for a Gibbs measure here. Let me say G like Gibbs size n, temper inverse temperature beta. I take two here, means I take two replica. And, let look, and then I look at the overlap under this two replica. So this is a random object, right? The Gibbs measure is still random here. Then if I look at the probability, uh, at the, so this is the probability under the Gibbs measure that the overlap is, I'm sorry, is in a set A. Then take log, divide by n. And this, essentially, it's not exactly the limit. It's a large deviation principle. So you have a limb soup and a limit, but the limb is essentially minus the infimum of a certain rate function on A. So this rate function, so this, this A is a subset of the real line. The overlap is between negative 1 and 1. So this I is a function on the real line, and this is the Franz Parisi potential. So proving this, and it's, it, it is described otherwise, not like that. There is a big description of this thing, but this is the important int interpretation of it. So here, I really do not agree with the way physics calls this. This is, for me, absolutely, totally, completely quenched. Right? There is no expectation nowhere. Right? This is a purely random object. This is not random. But this is called the annealed Franz Parisi potential just to confuse everybody. Right? 
And then when we discussed, I realized that there was an, an even stranger object that would, give, would be the quench for inspiracy potential, which is the one that really is supposed to be the ultimate weapon. So we haven't been there yet, but probably we will. So once you have this object, basically, what the uh, how how it does this object influences the influence? And all that is known in physics. Uh, Florent or, or Lenka or others know that well. If this i Depending on the structure of this function i, you can detect if there is slow mixing or not. By slow, I mean exponential mixing. So what we prove is under the existence of cert under a certain type of behavior for this, you will have large you will have exponential mixing, and we expect that when it, this behavior does not happen, you don't have exponential mixing, which means that of course it does, we, do, we would not prove there. We are far from proving that the mixing would be fast but it would at least not be exponential, and we do hope that it will be fast. So what is the structure is, let's, so this i, the, minimi the minimizer of this function will, will naturally be in the support of the parity measure. So if, for instance, you are in a replica symmetric situation, you have only one minimizer. Right? If you are in a, let's say, one RSB, you have necessarily two minimizers. So when you have a barrier like this between two, two points like that, then the mixing is slow, very natural. All right, that's what we prove. But you don't need that. You don't need one RSB. For instance, as soon as you have something like this, mixing is slow too, right? This corresponds in a P-spin, for instance, what I was without a spike, to this phase where you are in the replica symmetric region this is replica symmetric because you have only one minimum, and where you had this multitude of, 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 of uh, where, where the Gibbs measure was concentrated on exponentially many wells. Okay, that's this picture, and then the dynamics would still be slow. Okay, and with this picture, the dynamics will stop to be ex um, exponentially slow when you stop having this shoulder, when you go to something like this, right, or or, or that. I mean. Nothing like this, right? So this transition happens at a temperature, which is not the dynamical tra tra temperature, which is higher. So that might not be optimal. To get the dynamical transition, you need the quench parity potential, French parity potential. But, but in any case, we are in the process of trying to prove that w when you are this theorem doesn't tell you that when you're like that, the dynamics is fast. It says when you're like that, we cannot prove that the dynamic is exponentially slow. Right? Very different. But we do hope that, in fact, the dynamic will be fast. How fast? I don't know. Maybe it won't be completely uh, finite time, or maybe it will be polynomial. I don't know. But this is exactly what we want to understand in order to know that the Langevin type of dynamics will, con will find your estimator, your theta up there, fast. The, uh, and how is that related to the spiked tensor model? I didn't do this computation, but we can dream. The, when, if you look at the French parity, so first, there's one computation that has been done by physics. It's the case k equal 1 in the spiked tensor model that I was describing. That is simply this p spin with a field. Of course, if you increase the field, you will see this transition. Right? This, uh, the, the French parity potential will become nice, and then and the dyna dynamics will be fast, faster, right? That's, uh, but uh, uh, but so I, I I do expect that the complexity transition I was explaining would, if it corresponded to this, of course, or or the same thing for the quench French parity potential, then it would be really nice. It would say, as soon as the uh, the, the the static, if you want, description. The geometric description, the geometric complexity is nice, then the dynamics can found this. In practice, it's certainly not true. There is always a gap between what the, the information theory thing, that is, if what the landscape can allow you to find and what the dynamics can allow you to find. Right? So that there is something to understand there. So the, the shape of this thing for this kind of model is there probably is a transition, but not necessarily at the same place. 
All right. And uh, with that, of course, I will stop.